Hello, welcome to episode three of our podcast mini series on crypto recovery. I'm Chris Pease, and again, I'm here with Megan Elms and James Drury. Thanks for joining me, guys. This episode is going to focus on tracing crypto, the steps that can be taken. We're going to talk a bit about what it looks like to actually track transactions and where crypto is going when it's on chain. And we're also going to be talking about some of the obstacles to that process and what we can do when we face those obstacles. James, do you want to describe as simply as you can how it is that you view and you track crypto transactions and how you see it moving from from wallet to wallet? Yeah, I think a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on crypto being very sophisticated and complicated. And actually, it is quite simple in its very core state. So if you take Ethereum as the blockchain, we'll look at for this example, most blockchains will have a blockchain explorer, which is generally a website which will list every transaction that takes place on that blockchain. So Etherscan is the one that you use for Ethereum. And if you went onto that and typed in your own wallet address, you can see its current balance at that exact exact moment in time, you can see what other tokens it may hold on the Ethereum blockchain, whether that's NFTs or different coins. You can also then see the ledger. So you're looking at the transaction dates, the, the transaction hash to where it sits on the, the blockchain. You're looking at what wallets it's interacting with. So it's in and out and the value of those. And that is a public resource that I think we all should be if we're looking at asset recovery be making ourselves familiar with because it's free it's not particularly complicated and it just shows you a very neat way of navigating through that blockchain although you have different websites for the different blockchains that they actually tend to look quite similar don't they yeah and one of the most interesting things of course is that as james says whilst he can go onto one of these websites and see what's in his own wallet and where it came from and where it came from before that etc obviously you know equally i could go onto any computer and look at his wallet as well, which is one of the fascinating things about crypto and crypto ownership is that it is entirely public in that sense. You may not know who owns a particular wallet, but you can see where it's gone. You can see the wallet it's, it's come from. You can see the wallet it's been transferred to and you can keep following it in that sense. And of course, ownership is not anonymous in a true sense. It's pseudonymous in the sense that once you know who owns a particular wallet, you can see all the transactions that that particular person is responsible for. And so in an asset recovery scenario, if you know or you suspect that a number of wallets are all owned by the same person, then of course, uncovering that person's identity will tell you all of the transactions that that person is responsible for. Correct me if I'm wrong, James, but I think there are probably two main obstacles, certainly in my experience, when I looked at transactions on chain and tried to follow, you know, from, from beginning to end, it seems to me that there are two different things which can crop up. One, I think, is where tokens are sent to an exchange. And the other is where tokens are sent to a decentralized mixer fund. James, do you want to explain what a mixer is? I think people will already be familiar with an exchange, but what's a mixer? So a mixer, as we saw in the Chainswap case, they used Tornado Cash in that example. So what it is, is that let's say I'm a hacker in this scenario. And I've just stolen some crypto from Megan. I'm then going to approach the mixer. I'm going to engage with that mixer via my wallet address. That mixer, if we look at Tornado Cash's example, will give me a code. I am then trusting them with the stolen crypto. And then I am basically, according to the website for Tornado Cash, told to wait a period of time to conceal my identity because what they're doing is you're putting the crypto in there. It's jumbling it all up with lots of other users who engage with that mixer, which means that on the other end where all of this crypto has gone into it jumbled up and it's coming out the other side, it makes it a lot harder to follow. So when you then go back to the mixer, so I go back to Tornado Cash, I put in the code that they've given me and then it will release it to the wallet address that I've decided to be. How does it look? So we, we're using one of these websites that you've described, James, to, to track across you know, a, a particular token or, or, or batch of tokens and they're moving from wallet to wallet and then you see they hit a mixer. But what does that actually look like in terms of what you're seeing on your screen? So you're seeing, if you're looking at Etherscan again, you're seeing your wallet and in to another wallet address, which is the Tornado Cash wallet address. I'm sorry, just using Tornado Cash as the example in this. So from Tornado Cash, if you then put the Tornado Cash wallet address into Etherscan, you're generally seeing two wallet addresses spat out the other side. 
One is what they call a relayer, which is where the mixer will take a very small percentage for fulfilling that duty of theirs. And then the other one is the, the wallet address, which the hacker is hoping he has concealed and is going off into the sunset. Okay, so we, so we have these two potential problems or obstacles when we're trying to trace. As I say, we've, we've got tokens being sent um, into potentially large centralized exchanges, and you don't know where the money goes from there, and, and then you've got tokens being sent through mixes. Megan, what do you do in the first of those scenarios? What happens if you see that tokens have gone to a wallet which is owned by a centralized exchange? So if you can get to a centralized exchange, the hope is... And almost the expectation is that some of them will be holding KYC information for their user base. And as we know, these exchanges are becoming subject to more and more regulation. So you can become increasingly optimistic once you hit that point in the tracing exercise. The level of KYC that the exchanges might hold can vary quite considerably. Also, just because they have it, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to give it to you. And that's when you might have to consider going down the court route to compel them to give it to you. And shows the importance, I think, of being able to, you know, open up dialogue with some of these these exchanges and see, and and as you say, outside of the courtroom, see what they're willing to give you without those court orders in the first instance. Because as you say, if if it's a case that they may be able to tell you, you know, tokens from one wallet that went into the exchange have actually been paid to another wallet and they can give you that, at least you can carry on your investigation, your, your tracing exercise. And no doubt it will be different when you're actually asking them for the identity of all of a wallet owner at which stage i would have thought they're they're enhanced confidentiality obligations and it's at that stage they've become insistent on me providing a course order for them to provide the information and something i just wanted to touch on before we move on is when we talk about kyc we're not necessarily always talking about asking an exchange to disclose the identity of their user as james has said often if that exchange isn't providing an on or off ramp they might not have that information But what some of them will still have is an email address or, as Chris has said, another wallet address. And that links to the commerciality of this that also is in the background, which is while we will all be quite happy to carry on tracing this crypto as far as it may go, the more information you get and the more email addresses you get, the more pressure you can exert on the hacker. And that's exactly what happened on our chain swap case. We use litigation in different jurisdictions. We use criminal law enforcement routes to create an environment such that the hacker knew that we were about to find out identity and we had an email address and we had a way of contacting him and that brought him to the table for settlement discussions. We spent a bit of time there talking about exchanges. James, do you want to tell us a bit about tracing through mixes and how difficult or how easy that might be and how you do it in practice? I mean, at the moment, it's very much software driven. So there are a number of very big and good, sophisticated companies out there that assist with it. The reality is you, you're not going to be able to do this during these blockchain explorers. It's just a bit more sophisticated than that. So there does need to be a bit more of a sophisticated look at it. And it comes down to, and I think we were quite lucky on ours in the fact that there was a human element to it. I think if you've done something wrong, people panic because as you've explained on other pods, is that they're impatient. They want to get their money out. They know that it can be quickly shut down. Things can be frozen. The ether scan and all these other blockchain explorers, as soon as, and again, we look at Chainswap as the example, as soon as that hack happened, there's a flag put on the wallet addresses that went to the hacker. So anybody who sees that wallet interacting with them, they know that that has been reported as being a wallet that is under investigation or has been part of a hack. So there is an element of them wanting to move the money quickly. And that's why I think we are fortunate that they did it all in an hour. But that may not be the case. So the longer people wait and the more mixes, more wallets, it becomes a lot harder. But the end goal is always to try and see get it back to an exchange. The reality is you look at the Bitfinex hack in 2017, I think it was. Was the, the crypto taken off of that exchange sat in cold wallets for four or five years and just sat there until early 2022, where I think the US government managed to identify them and recover it. So something could be a waiting game. The reality is it's every it's situation is very different. Examples there, because of course, you know, right at the opposite ends of the spectrum, because of course, and as you've touched upon in our chain swap case, what the hackers seemed to do was 24 payments, all fairly substantial payments in stable coin went into the mixer in the space of an hour and not even 24 hours had gone by before the hackers then requesting the, the same, you know, 24 payments are coming out again. So I suppose in some ways it probably isn't going to get much easier than that. 
have to trace through. But at the end of the day, and this is certainly in my mind cause for optimism, provided you, that you have the right software that can sort of track all of these payments in over an extended period and all of these payments out over an extended period, it should, in theory, you should be able to match up or at least look for patterns which will give you a good idea of whether to yeah, two payments are payment in and the payment out can be matched up and are probably being done for the benefit of the same person. And one final point I want to make here is, you know, we're talking about taking these inputs and these outputs and, and trying to match them. And of course, it can be very hard in that situation to say definitively this payment and this payment are the same one. And the people who created Tornado Cash cannot tell you that because this is a self-executing program. It's a smart contract and you don't know what's happening in the middle you know it is a, it is a black box in that respect but of course if the purpose toward this is to go to the court and persuade the judge yeah you know, these payments are the same and therefore the person who owns the wallet that pays in is the same as who owns the wallet that's receiving well as long as you can show on the balance of probabilities that that's the case as long as you can show that you know the real likelihood that, that they are linked then that will normally be enough for you to get the relief that you're seeking at court that was a fascinating chat about the tracing exercises that can be conducted and, and, and what some of the obstacles are and how we get around them. Thank you very much, James and Megan, for joining me in the next session. We'll be talking about pursuing persons unknown, which is, is of course, highly relevant to cases where there's been hacks. Thank you.